Wait, what are you doing here? Well, I'm getting late. Got to run. Oh, okay, see ya. Wait, how did you get here in the... Enrique, no! I need help. He's in the system. Wait! Oh, yeah! He... Enrique. I'll give you the power to defeat Dan for good. I just battled a cyber demon with DDR. And then another one turned me into Britney Spears! I can talk to him. Enough people know of us as it is. We don't need one more. Oh. I'm sorry about this, Kate. Basically, once Dan broke down your control matrix, he tried to expand through the system, but the firewalls kept him stuck in the oceanic sector, and he seems to have just gone on a rampage. The network just wasn't designed to handle that kind of energy load. The quantum tunnels and webways are completely worn out, and uh, simply I don't know how long it will take for them to heal, but the superstructure at least is still intact. So, will we be able to use the teleporters anytime soon? Well, not unless you want the electrons ripped off your atoms as your protons explode. Um, short trips might be possible if we could develop some kind of shielding. Maybe we could ask Zyde if he could develop something from his transdimensional systems. There's no way they'd let us get our hands on that kind of tech. We'll have to make do with what we've got. Just like the old days, eh, Vink? Yeah, luckily we don't have to deal with the kind of rogues they did, though. Speaking of, how are you going with the Spirit Energy Sensor Array? It's no good. The readings are still all over the place. It's going to need a complete overhaul. Till then we're flying blind. Who would have thought your little friend could have caused so much trouble? How's he going after the patch anyway? He seems stable. I'm checking in when I can. He's a lucky guy. No one's had that kind of contact with the spirit since the Epoch. Angel or otherwise. It was a pretty big energy burst. I hope no one else saw it. Even if someone did, it spread so quickly that it couldn't have been traced back to him. I don't think he's in danger. She's alive. And what makes you so powerful? Hello everyone and welcome to Keith's Crappy Consoles, where we'll be searching through the masses of Pongs, plug and plays and pop stations to see if any of them actually have games worth playing. Now most of the systems I've stored away for this series is little stuff like this, or this, or even a couple of these, but that's all for another time. But there are a couple of them that are a little too big to fit in an old postage box. Two of them, in fact. So for this double billing of KCCCs, we'll be taking a look at two snowboard plug-in plays. Would you look at that? We're already doing better than last episode by actually recording an intro. First on the slopes is this. The, uh... Play TV Snowboarder. For this one, you have the board and the base in two pieces. The board sits on top, which gives a decent range of movement in this low friction divot thing. And as you tilt the board around, it hits these little orange switches to register the inputs. The base is then connected to this thing, which takes the batteries and plugs into the TV. The board itself is just a piece of wood with some plastic bits screwed in. Okay, let's uh, give it a try. You know, this doesn't actually feel too bad, you know, it's not too hard to balance, it's solid. I'm feeling good about this. Okay, let's give it a try. Now these are some cool jams. Okay, I'll stop. Right off the bat, the control situation isn't brilliant. You use left, right, and back to make selections on the menu, and to make allowances for the imprecision of the board, there's a substantial indicated delay between the press of the button and the effect on the menu, which can be irritating. 
When you're on the main menu and already complaining about the controls, you know dark times are ahead. There are four modes to choose from, Slalom, Freeride, Half Pipe, and Big Air. All of them with EXTREME EXCLAMATION POINTS! There are also three characters to choose from and three difficulty modes. There's a lesson in optimism we can all get here. Anybody expecting someone to get an expert skill level in the Play TV Snowboarder is like expecting someone to buy a deluxe edition of The Order 1886. But if you want to skip it all, there's also a quick play option which takes you straight into Freeride. Looks like even the devs knew that the kids wouldn't want to deal with their menus. And frankly, it probably didn't take them too long to not want to deal with the game either. Okay, so let's start with the positives. Um, there's a moving image on the screen. Moving on. The controls are a mess both digitally and physically. To move down the slope, you lean forward on the board, backwards to brake, and tilt left and right to perform the implied. Apart from occasional Rad Racer style turns, the bulk of the game is jumps and the tricks they enable. Going over a jump at speed gives you air and then combinations of inputs will perform tricks that contribute to your score. Well, that's the theory anyway. As you can imagine, the dead zone is significant, which already makes play feel sluggish. But then that's compounded by the use of smooth multi-frame animations for turning. If you aren't constantly leaning forward enough to engage the front switch, then you stall out and you won't be able to move until you lean forward again. And while the sensitivity on that is a bit unforgiving, it wouldn't be so bad if the game didn't look so dead whenever it happened. When you aren't moving, there's no background action, and because the game has such a poor sense of speed in general, whenever it happened, my instinct was to assume the game had frozen. Nah, I'll, I'll let that one be. I keep coming into a stop when I don't mean to, and I don't even get why they bother putting braking into the game at all. In a game this simple, there's literally no reason you'd want to stop or slow down. On top of speed, the game seems to struggle with space as well, like here in the slalom course. The poles that you're supposed to try and weave between seem to fall apart from each other in a slightly disorienting fashion. I'm guessing because the hardware lacks the ability to properly scale sprites. And the same thing happens to these flags in Freeride that seem to shift around the course as you approach. Also, is it just me or does the slalom course music sound like something out of Doom? Listen. So what about the feature that is arguably the most important in any boarding game? The tricks. Well, I'm sure that, despite my inexperience of such games, I could give you a thorough evaluation of the mechanics and regale you with the intricacy of its deployment in comparison to many other notable game series on various systems. If I could ever get it to bloody work. Ah. Even if you manage to steer the board onto the jump you want, which isn't always easy, there's no sense of precision whatsoever. Every control input feels like a guess. So precisely executing the multiple inputs required for one trick, let alone two or three chained together, while you're in the air is nearly impossible. The only decent tricks I've ever managed were by accident, but even if you do somehow manage it, and bonus points if you manage the trick you were intending, you are faced with a new challenge that is the most difficult yet, not falling over. Hello and welcome to Standing Up School. And you fail. In order to land a jump, you need to be leaning back. Even if you do a jump idling up to it and touch nothing, you will still crash unless you manage to lean back enough. And what really mashes my motherboard is that despite the criticality of your Y-dimensional orientation to not going Ganali, Radica made the decision that graphical distinction between the state at which a crash or a landing would occur would be entirely superfluous. One f***ing take! The character animation frames, right before a successful landing and an unsuccessful one, are identical, and when combined with the input ambiguity, it means that you're never really sure if you're going to land. Also, something I noticed while dead zone testing on the main menu using this little icon thing, is that sometimes when I thought I was holding backwards, I was actually engaging left or right, which was probably screwing up my tricks and landings as well. Fine exact inputs are hampered not just by the dead zone though, but also by the board's divot mechanism. It has a noticeable amount of static friction, making every movement jerky. Trying to play this game takes up a lot of your concentration, and even after just a few minutes, my foot's cramping up and I'm starting to get really tired from trying to balance on the board. But it's weird, because when I'm just balancing on the board normally, then like, it's not difficult. I can just balance and do whatever I want. But as soon as I'm playing the game, or even just imagining playing the game, imagining the obstacles in front of me, and trying to avoid them, it suddenly takes a lot more effort. Even on the relatively simple half-pipe mode where you just go left and right and perform tricks, I had to keep grabbing furniture around me to stop from falling over. Now I can think of a reason you'd want to stop. 
is to let your body recover. Even after you finish a course, the struggle isn't over. Trying to enter your initials is a chore and a half considering the delay it inherits from the main menus. And when you do finish the race, you need to be really careful because if you're not, then you'll accidentally auto-select replay and have to do it all again. Ah! And for salt on the wound, there's no way to back out of a race once it's started short of power-cycling the system. You know what? Screw this. My feet hurt. Let's see if this works. Hey, at least it's somewhat controllable now. Okay, in theory, I'm probably above some kind of designed weight limit, and these things are made for kids and not 22-year-old man-children. But come on, there's no getting past the fact that the interface is a couple of switches on a piece of plastic. This isn't a rolling rocker or something, there's nothing complicated to go wrong here. No, I take it back! This thing says in the manual that it's rated for 180 pounds, that's 82 kilos in proper units, and there is no way that you would rate this thing for 82 kilos without expecting adults to use it. I don't care how American you are. Now that said, it's probably rated for adults because there's no way they could trick any kids into playtesting this piece of crap. If you're still curious, unlucky, or masochistic enough to pick this thing up, then one final annoyance is that you can't actually learn any of the game's tricks in the game. You need the manual for that. And some of them are ridiculous, requiring up to four different inputs, and hello? What's this? Handle this game carefully. Store this game away from dusty or dirty areas. Keep this game away from moisture and extreme temperature. Do not mix old and new batteries. I'm such a rebel. Insert batteries with the correct polarity. You know, I really don't know why they bother with that particular warning. I mean, what's the worst that could happen from putting the... Yeah. Ah! Well, I think we're finished with that. Oh crap, I forgot to talk about the big air mode. Uh, big air is a big joke. <laughs> well, that's one down and one to go. Moving up market now with this SSX branded board from EA Sports Big. Uh, EA Sports Big was an offshoot of EA Sports from the early 2000s, which dealt with some of the more extreme sports. I mean, playing soccer in a FIFA tournament? That's nothing. Pedestrian. Basic, even. You now, playing soccer in the street? Well, that's big. Now, unlike the other board, this one is all in a single unit with a sort of tilting mechanism in it. But it still has this puck off the side with some menu buttons on it. Now, I'm a little unnerved by these menu buttons being there. I mean, you thought the snowboard was a bad enough control mechanism that people would rather bend down to the ground to operate the menus? I don't know, maybe I'm just overthinking this. Speaking of inputs, they work on this board by rocking it back and forward on a hinge for up and down, and this kind of pedal pad thing is used for left and right. Now this board has a lot more to prove than the other one because it's staking claim to the SSX series which is argued by many to be the gold standard in snowboarding games. This is like if Call of Duty made a plug and play, or Gran Turismo, or FIFA. Although FIFA did do one, that, that, that was a thing, that was real. But, but anyway, to ascertain this game's claim to fame, I have gone out and bought SSX and SSX Tricky to see what they're all about. Ultra quick 10 second review of SSX GO! And as for SSX1... She's cheap, she's stupid, and she wouldn't load. Well, not for me, anyway. Just a quick note, I paid the exact same amount for this and Tricky. So, with that in mind... Okay, now I'm just saying something generic as a transition to turn the game on...
Radica. Oh no. What? Oh no. Not again. I'm sure it can't be that bad. I mean, they've had a couple of years to work out the kinks, and and on the bright side, at least it hasn't asked me for a season pass and a bunch of loot boxes yet. The game is laid out much the same as the last one, but with a noticeable bump in quality that comes with the lick of SSX paint. That said, the average Atari Jaguar game would have a noticeable bump in quality, but I digress. It's got all the same modes, with the addition of multiple courses, riders, and an overall aesthetic from SSX Tricky. Even before we get into the game, it's obvious that there's a bit more power under the hood, from things like the visuals and little refinements like the smoother, more colourful menus, and it carries on to the game proper too. It looks better with larger, more detailed sprites, and a lower angle, and I think a wider colour palette, plus the music isn't bad either. The engines also received an upgrade too, with better looking level geometry and smoother physics. As I said, this is somewhat based on SSX Tricky, with the most prominent borrowed feature being the Tricky Meter, which acts the same as in SSX Tricky. Successfully pulling off better tricks fills up your Tricky Meter, and to help with this, doing the trick gives a little boost to your hang time, allowing for easier chaining of more tricks. The meter only stays full for a very short amount of time before it starts trickling back down, but if you manage to get airborne quick enough, you can perform a special uber trick. One thing I find really cool is that while the other tricks require up to 8 distinct inputs with multiple directions at once held for different lengths of time, the uber trick is just a simple back, forward, back. This presents quite a unique challenge in going from trying to pull off these complicated tricks in quick succession to a very simple and deliberate movement. Here you can see me trying to calm down and pull it off, but I'm too worked up and accidentally hitting all the buttons. I don't know, it just felt sort of... focusing, if you get what I mean. One issue is that there's a lot of apparent slowdown on the corners, and you can't seem to accelerate while turning, which hampers the game's otherwise quick pace. And also, the accidental stopping does rear its ugly head occasionally, but not very often. And it's mitigated by the introduction of SSX's numerical speedo, allowing you to better monitor your speed, which is especially handy in the lead up to jumps. I gotta say though, this little steering pad thing, while a marked improvement over the previous example, is a bit harder to use than it should be with my large foot. And I was getting cramped up a bit, until I put on a shoe. Having that wider, rigid interface between my foot and the switch makes it so much more comfortable and responsive. And before anyone starts yelling at me about how I shouldn't be standing on this thing with shoes on, it does recommend it in both manuals, but it's more to prevent slipping than control. And in those times when you do lose control, the crashes have a very quick and forgiving recovery time. And as I made clear when I reviewed Burnout 2, quick recovery from crash animations in any game is crucial to maintain flow and engagement. But despite all these improvements, I do need to clarify that the gameplay doesn't resemble SSX in any meaningful way. Courses are obviously a lot simpler, relying on scattered obstacles rather than big sweeping toboggan runs. It's still all just single player events as opposed to races, which I can't imagine would have been too hard to implement considering games like OutRun and Red Racer have been doing it in this kind of perspective since the 80s. For combos where you need to hold an input, it even flashes to tell you that you've held it long enough. I wish this was in real boarding games. Another unique feature are these fans, which blast you up to perform tricks, which is pretty cool when you think about it. And they're a perfect fit for the wild SSX universe I am of. And it shows that the devs realize that while in normal SSX games, the racing and the tricks are just as engaging as each other, in this game, the most interesting thing is the tricks. So adding the fans just gives you more varied ways to do them. At the end of the day though, there's something I can say about this board that I couldn't say about the other one. And that is that I had fun. Honest to God, face smiling, grind for the high score, fun. And that's something I wasn't expecting. It feels like Radica really learnt from their mistakes with the last one, and the more prestigious SSX license gave them the push that they needed to really make something nice. Now don't get me wrong, it's nothing amazing, but it's at least an interesting little curio. The last thing I want to talk about quickly is, while I was writing this episode, Metal Jesus Rocks did a review of this plug and play, and he had a less than stellar opinion of it citing oversimple courses, un-SSX-like gameplay elements like fans and sloppy controls among his grievances. 
But if I might be so bold as to offer a theory questioning the methodology of a YouTuber literally 2,000 times my size, maybe MJR you would have had a slightly better time if you'd worn shoes? I mean, to be fair, it took me a while to work that out myself, but you really do gain so much more control with the shoes on. And if you want to try these things out for yourself at home, well, you can, because both of these games are on main. Yeah, I know, right? I guess those guys are just running out of ROMs to dump. There's also one more version of this kind of system, called the Radica White as opposed to the Radica Blue. This is a real Frankenstein's monster which combines the later SSX game engine, albeit with all the SSX licensed elements stripped out, right down to redesigning the tricky meter and even housing it in the same style puck with the board mechanism of the first board. Ugh. So to finish off, are any of these snowboarders worth keeping around? Well, for me, no. As I said at the beginning, these things are just too big to be keeping up space any longer. But while the TV snowboarder will be... dealt with, the SSX board will be donated to some worthy op shop, where it will hopefully get in the hands of someone who appreciates it. That's all for this episode of Keeps Crappy Consoles. See you next time. Hey everyone, thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, this video was supposed to get out a lot quicker than it did, but uh, because of the Resident Evil 4 project draining me so much and having to shift focus to that and that, it just kind of got delayed and delayed and delayed. But yeah, I just want to announce that I've started a Discord for this channel. The link is in the description. Um, it's We just talk about retro games there. There's a couple fun challenges, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, hopefully you're enjoying that. Like, share, subscribe. Blah, blah, blah. See you guys next time.